You are listening to Faceless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rose. Each week, we design new decks for tournament play. Then we put our creations to the test so we can share our findings on the air, what worked, what didn't, and what can we improve for the next week. On today's episode, David and Moore go deep into some obscura brews, showing how much a few new toys can change the playground both in modern and pioneer. Is it time for Esper to finally shine once again? Tune in and see you on today's episode of Faceless Brewing. to the Faithless Ruin podcast. It is me, Mord, all the way from cold Argentina. Tonight, I'm being joined by all the way from not so cold USA, David. How is it going, Dave? Party in the USA, baby. Shoutouts to Miley Cyrus, wherever she is. She was here not so long ago. My partner went and see her really? in the Lollapalooza. I mean, I'm sure everyone had a good time. She, you know, it's a lot of energy. She gave quite a show, yeah. I heard exactly that. So, how is it going? All the w- We haven't talked since... 50 minutes ago, or two days for like the audience. <laughs> Things are good. Things are beautiful in uh, the US and A. Uh, we have a bunch of fun stuff to talk about today. So for the people who listened on Friday, we went over all the announcements. The Baldur's Gate, Band Talk, and Pioneer. Uh, we even did a little dip of the toe into Shadow of the Scalds in both Pioneer and Modern. Today, we are going to talk about our work on the Ledger Shredder brews, and we also are going to brew generally in the Obscura, yes, or Esper no. if you're my age. <laughs> Esper generally. So there's a bunch of interesting cards in the uh, New Capenna set that sort of allow you to explore the Esper space. We are just going to come up with a, a bunch of brainstorming ideas for that. But before we do, we have to do a little housekeeping at the top. Yeah, exactly. So most of the housekeeping today is going to be tell us why we do the housekeeping? That's because we love our Patreons because they help us keep the show going. They support the show, and in return, they get access to our Discord, which is this beautiful hive mind of think alive people. Think of hundreds of brewers just trying to find their perfect deck, and then think again of them not finding it and just tumbling again and again. That's us. <laughs> Nothing works, but we'll try to make it work. It's a beautiful place filled with amazing people, and they really do their best. We constantly just make our best to try and find the perfect build for any car. We try to help each other, we try to find builds, we try to brew around. And it's all in all just amazing fun and a beautiful community. Maybe the brews are the friends we made along the The way. The brews were the friends we made along the way. I couldn't (laughs) have said it better. As well, they get access to voting for cards whenever we do our monthly project or such. It's a new one coming in just... A week or two, actually, as we give our close down to Invoca Lamedic pretty soon, we post our leg list and publish the results of our leagues. So you get to vote on that, on what cards we will play alongside fun perks like merchandise and otherwise. Also, remember, we're starting a YouTube channel where we keep uploading content. Please tell us what you think, what did you like, what did you least like, what was the best part, and what would you like to change as we keep going forward. There's nothing that helps better than positive or constructive feedback. It doesn't have to be positive, it has to be well, well-intentioned. <laughs> well, new critical theory would say that intent is irrelevant. Uh, but yeah, what what we're what we're looking for is what do people like, right? This this is something that has been asked for a lot. Dan talks about almost since the beginning of the podcast. He was getting feedback from fans of the the podcast that wanted to see some kind of you know streaming or recorded uh, you know version of some of these leagues. They want to see some of these decks in action. What can we do? Um, so yeah, we're, we're still in sort of an inquit phase. There's all kinds of stuff that can still be changed. So this is a good time. Do you want to hear, uh, you know, people walking through their play pattern in real time? Do you want to hear them looking back on it and, and describing what they did, you know, as they remember it, you know, with it sort of edited. So you show the, the random or excuse me, the important decisions and stuff. Uh, you know, you don't have to sit through an entire match. Do you want to hear soothing, you know, ambient uh, sounds <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> as as you watch, you know, uh, Dan uh, uh, dominate uh, or fumble through a league? So yeah, this this is your chance to give that feedback, and uh, we're definitely paying a lot of attention to it because we're still trying to decide exactly what this is going to look like. Exactly, because we want to give you something that you're either not going to find elsewhere or that we can provide better, right? 
Because if we're just going to do what everybody else does, why are we doing it? Absolutely. I think with that being said, you all know us. You all know why we love why we love the Patreon. We all know why we love the Discord. With that, we can jump onto what boomers will call Esper Week. And everybody else will call Obscura. And with everybody else, I mean just me, because everybody's going to stick with the shards name because they are better. But Obscura decks. Yeah, so the uh, Obscura family had uh, a bunch of cards that were of interest. And uh, especially of interest, I think, is the new Triome. I guess it's not called a Triome. I don't even know what Rafin's it's called. Tower. <laughs> All right, Rafine's Tower. So Rafine is also a card, uh, I think, that, that is uh, of, of great interest as well. So let's start in Pioneer. The uh, the interesting cards, I think, in the, the sort of uh, Obscura space are the Obscura Interceptor. Yes. Rafine him- itself. Void Rend, you know, as maybe a one or two of. Uh, th- those are the cards that are the ones that kind of like reach out to me and say, all right, th- this is a card that's actually like worth brewing around. This is, this is a card that does something unique. Uh, it interacts in an interesting way. And obviously, I mean, I love Flash. So the Interceptor especially just calls out I to would me. like to add to that list Obscura Charm as a pretty powerful card that still hasn't seen any play, but I think that eventually someone will try to find a way to play it because of how versatile the second and third mode are. Sorry, the first and third mode are. I just hope Obscura Ascendancy is somewhere playable. I don't think it is. Like, I'm pretty sure it's not. But the Dream of Throne 3 Obscura Ascendancy in Mishra's Bubble will get... No, Obscura's... Oh, it, it, it doesn't even count the zero, which I think it's better, actually. So Obscura Ascendancy into a prismatic ending, into, I don't know, Tainted Indulgence, the Fairy, and see how it goes. The fourth... I think the fourth spot is the really odd one. Yeah, uh, I guess Grief? Grief into Solitude into prismatic ending for six. <laughs> I'm gonna kill your Ragavan, but I'm gonna pay six white mana for it. But yeah, cards like Ending and March are interesting in those types of shells that you're describing because they are modular and how much they cost. Exactly. So that makes it easier to meet the requirement. The problem is that, you know, the original spoiled version of the, the Ascendancy was so sweet and then they like kept editing it down to what it actually was, which kept making it significantly weaker. Which was the rich- So I'm going to read the card before you tell me that. It's Esper Mana for a- three mana, so Esper Mana for an enchantment that reads, whenever you cast a spell, if its mana value is equal to one plus the number of soul counters on Obscura Ascendancy, put a soul counter on Obscura Ascendancy, then create a 2-2 white creature spirit with flying. As long as there are five or more counters on, Ob- on Obscura Ascendancy, spirits get plus three plus three. Obscura is such a hard word, to- hard word for me to pronounce. That's not a common sound. Obs- yeah, Obscura. It's... It's, it is a very uh, awkward phrase. Well, the original translation was greater than oh, okay. uh, or equal to. Okay, that would have been busted, I think. Yeah, I was like, wow, this card's really powerful. Like, you could just play, like, Manamorphos into something else and, like, a three drop. And all of a sudden, you've got, like, you've made six power. But, yeah, not, not to be. Which is fine. Whatever. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, a lot of interesting cards and some not Esper cards. But in formats like Modern, just the fact they are black cards make you go into black because no one plays black otherwise, like Tainted Indulgence. Yeah, exactly. And Tainted Indulgence has seen a lot of play in Pioneer, very, very specifically in the Grease Fang list, right? Uh, it's not the de facto Grease Fang list. In fact, there were five Grease Fang lists in one recent uh, deck dump. I think two Esper, one Orzov, uh, one Abzan, and one Junk. Abzan? So that's I haven't seen the upside yet. Yeah, you can just ba- basically they just try to like get lucky with the milling. They play the um the one one black zombie, the the two mana one one satyr that mills four. Um but then you also get to play playable or more playable equ- vehicles because you just get to play the Cadillac. And so that's actually really hard to deal with, and, and it's come up multiple times. You just play the Cadillac on four. You play this, crew it, you attack with the Cadillac and the two cats, you you activate one. If they kill the Cadillac in response to you crewing it, the Grease Fang just brings it back next turn. So you almost have to like let that first attack get in if you don't have counter magic. Like kill the Grease Fang instead. And so okay. like you just get a ton of value out of your out of your uh, your quote unquote fair plan. So it's a much better fair deck while being a much wor- much worse combo deck. Okay. Okay, I like that. Because buying back the, the frickin' Cadillac every turn and then also getting to attack with it is just... It's six power that sticks. It's crazy. <laughs> it's pretty much... I think you should read that card before we keep mentioning it. Um... Yeah, so that's because Chariot, three and a green. 
It's a 4-4 vehicle. When it comes in play, it makes two cats. So it requires four to crew. Grease Fang has four power. So you can just, if you play Chariot on four, you play Grease Fang the next turn. You crew up Chariot. You get to attack with the two cats and the Chariot. If they let the Chariot attack, they get to, they take eight, they kill the Grease Fang, and you've made another cat. All right, that's pretty sweet. If they choose to kill the Chariot, or maybe they're forced to because they're at low life, the Grease Fang just brings Chariot back next turn, gives it haste, so you make two more cats, and it crews it, and you get to attack with the Chariot again. So uh, it's a very powerful fair plan, um, but it, it's way less likely to combo because looting is so much more powerful than just milling randomly from the top of your deck. Exactly. So it's going to be much more... Yeah, so that version seems like more power and more chaos. Yeah, exactly. We went a bit on a tangent just because I have never heard of that and it's really interesting... So we have a lot of interesting cards, and you just said immediately after we started talking about Obscura, Obscura Interceptor was your favorite. Yeah, so Obscura Interceptor is one, a black, a blue, and a white for a 3-1 flash. When it comes into play, you may return a spell on the stack to its owner's hand. And then when it comes into play, excuse me, I, I already got it wrong. When it comes into play, you may connive. <laughs> and when you do uh, connive in this way, which is interesting verbiage, uh, then you may return a spell on the stack to its owner's hand. So it comes into play as a 3-1. If you discard a non-creature spell, you uh, obviously get to make it a 4-2. Uh, you don't have to discard a creature to uh, get the, the trigger to return it back to your hand. And it does have lifelink which is an interesting ability in a format that has a ton of aggression right now, right? So uh, Mono Red is one of the best decks. Uh, Phoenix, obviously, uh, or the Blue Red Xerox list are all aggro uh, in a certain way. Returning a spell on the stack to their hand is actually quite good, specifically against Delve spells as well, right? You put the Treasure Cruise back in their hand, fine, they do get to cast it again. They might not have uh, seven more cards in their graveyard. Yeah, especially against anything that has an additional cost, it's just going to be extremely painful to recast so and i think something that's particularly relevant to add because you said it about the ruling when it connives this way doesn't mean it has to survive to do what it does it works in the same way legend shredder yeah exactly so you you play it they shock it or whatever and the connive still happens so the trigger to return the spell in the stack to their hand still happens exactly so one of the things that i yeah the first thing i thought about this is all right, the, the the these tempo decks often get behind on board. The lifelink here is actually very relevant, right? It can help stabilize. And the first thing I wanted to do was to connive away a Silver Smoke Ghoul. Conniving away Silver Smoke Ghoul puts it in your graveyard. It makes your Obscura Obcept Interceptor for power. And then you get to attack. And uh, you get to attack to gain four life and get your Silver Smoke Ghoul back. So it functionally does a lot. It, it actually comes into play, counters a spell, does better than draw a card. It draws a card and puts into play a 3-1 creature. No, I'm just, I just look at the leg list. There's one card that broke me in half. I don't know what that is. I, I think there's one card here that doesn't belong <laughs> outside of draft. Are you talking about Deathless Knight? I'm talking about Deathless I love it. So yeah, what I'm trying to do with this list is really lean into the like looting ability. So we're, we're playing all the cheap black interaction, which is the best in the format, uh, Push and Thoughtseize. We're playing four Faithful Mending for a couple reasons. One, Faithful Mending is a fine thing to just do uh, as long as you have a way to get value out of that. So the way to get value out of it is the one Deathless Knight or the Silver Smoke Ghoul. We have a bunch of ways that just gain one life. So if you Faithful Mending plus put a graveyard trespasser into play that turn, that's three life. You get back your um, Silver Smoke Ghoul. If you Faithless Mending, plus you have a Wandering Emperor in play that gets to minus two and gain two life, that's three life. You get to bring back your uh, Silver Smoke Ghoul. Graveyard Trespasser is just like one of the best hate bears in the format. All of the good sideboard cards are good against all the other colors except for black. Black does not have any of the great cyborg cards, and that actually makes Graveyard Trespasser basically the best way to like hate on red blue decks. They don't have a specific card that just answers it. No, no color does. You know, you can you can play Other Gust in, in your blue red list. You can play um Fry. You can you can do all kinds of stuff. You can't easily kill Graveyard Trespasser. It's always gonna be two for one. It's gonna attack graveyards, it's gonna gain extra life, right? To bring back Deathless Knight. And one of the things I've been obsessed with when I've seen how these Orzov mid-range lists is like making Graveyard Trespasser better. So one of the one of the ways to, to beat this card is it's kind of mopey. It's just a three mana three three that you know gains a life every once in a while, does a few extra damage. Well, we're playing 
Wandering Emperor, which can make Graveyard Trespasser bigger. We're playing Rafine, which can make Dress Gra Graveyard Trespasser bigger. Those are like really relevant cards in my mind because the extra power when you add a Graveyard Trespasser, it forces them into that two for one where Graveyard Trespasser requires them to cast a removal spell plus discard a card. And the extra buffing abilities for cards like Silver Smoke Ghoul, all of a sudden that's much more of a threat than it quote unquote ought to be. So this deck might be a little too mopey. There are, there are no cheap threats in it, right? It, the, the creatures are all on three. But I'm really liking to explore the idea of making these creatures that are like bad trades for the opponent actually forcing their removal. So I think my biggest issue with the first, when I see this list, is having Rafine with no one drop or two drop scares me a bit, right? Alongside Wandering Emperor. Is it insane to play some bad one drops in the form of, I don't know, Thraven or such? No, it's not insane. Uh, and if we if we go to the next list, like I'm I'm exploring similar space there as well. Okay. So this is a list with three Rafine, and I'm playing again the Fatal Push Thoughtseize. We're playing Archfiend's Vessel. Okay, that's a one mana one one lifelink. And Dan and uh, Damon always joke like they never ever kill this card. Well, what if we have a Rafine or a Wandering Emperor in play and we keep making it bigger, right? They're, they can't just take three damage lifelink or four damage lifelink every turn. How they, how can they win the race? They have to kill it. We're also playing uh, Jaspern's Prodigy and Rafine's Informant and a one of Charming Prince to go with our four extraction specialist. So this deck is much more uh, kind of what you're describing, Mord, where we're curving up to playing Rafine on three. Extraction specialist puts extra uh, creatures in the uh, in the in play. Extraction specialist itself has three power lifelink again we're playing some graveyard trespasser we're playing silver smoke ghoul uh the jvp you know is allowing us to if we're filling up our graveyard with rafine's informants etc and then extraction specialist getting back archfiend's vessel that's a very powerful play right we get a three two lifelink and a five five demon that can attack because it's not what you got back it's a token yep exactly and then you could imagine let's say we play rafine uh scheming seer on turn four and we attack with those two creatures which you know, now we're talking about attacking maybe with a seven power demon uh, in the air. Okay. And then again, we just have a few uh, four drops, Wandering Emperor, just the, the best white four drop, Skur Interceptor, and then a one of Ojitai's command, which is good with Vessel. It's okay with Jace Friend's Prodigy. It does gain life for Silver Smoke Ghoul. Gains four. It's counter a, counter a creature? Counter target creature. Return a, return a creature from your graveyard of casting cost two or less. Draw a card or gain four life. Bad, very bad cryptic command. Okay, yes. situational cryptic. Of but it lets you kind of like chain JVPs too, right? In the late game, right? You like, you counter their creature, get back JVP. JVP loots and flips because it's a late game. Then it can flash back Ojitai's command proactively. Yeah, draw a card, gain back a Archmage, uh What's the name of it? Archfiend's Vessel. Exactly, an Archfiend's Vessel and just stabilize the board. Yeah, because Jace Friend's Prodigy does not work well with counter magic normally. Ojitai's Command has two modes that you can at least cast proactively on your turn that aren't terrible uh, while being okay with J uh, Jace. Yeah. The other thing worth noting is that the reason we never want to play Jace typically is it just dies, right? They they get to stomp it, they get to cast, you know, Wild Slash, but it's like, all right, we don't mind if it dies because we actually want to play Extraction Specialist on three anyway. Uh, and just we just get our Jace back. We we want the two for one. So um, this is one of the only times I'm gonna play or recommend that anyone play Jace Prince Prodigy. For some reason, this might might be one of the first times I like seeing a Jace Prince Prodigy in a deck list. Ah, <laughs> see. <laughs> I mean, just the fact it works so well with so much of what you are doing. Like I hate Jace Prince Prodigy. Right. Okay. <laughs> because I maybe I was maybe I was born after it was good. Maybe I just came <laughs> late into the game. But I never saw it being half decent. However, the fact it has an amazing synergy with Extraction Specialist in both the fact that it doesn't care about not attacking or blocking, it can still do what it does, you can get it back in so many ways, and it flashbacks a lot of relevant stuff in this deck. I don't know, this might be the deck that sells me on trying Chase VP for once in my life. Yeah, it's nice because you play it on two. If they don't kill it, it can loot a two drop in your graveyard for Extraction Specialist. If they do kill it, it is the two drop for Extraction Specialist. And because it doesn't need to attack to do its thing, the Extraction Specialist is not a negative. Exactly. Also, it's it it doesn't seem like it should come up, but Jace being able to flip on their turn, like block, tap, put the fifth card in your graveyard, turns on Fatal Push, like that really matters. It seems crazy to modern players like you that that matters a lot, but it really matters. Uh, turning on Fatal Push at instant speed. Are, are they playing Winota? Are they attacking and you're surprising them with a, a play? Like it, it comes up a lot. I, I saw it happen only once, like in the really early days of the Shadow, they played... Um, like a couple Js? 
Yeah, and sometimes it came up that it flipped and turned a final push, but it's so uncomparable to like the Fetchlands and such in doing so. But in Pioneer, as you said, having the treasure from pla- from this period was so relevant. It's additional treasures. Treasures. Yeah. So yeah, that's a more mid-range version. Uh, I'm a little bit more excited about this. I, I think the other one was a little too clunky. The, the spells were a little more expensive. This one's a little more proactive as well. You know, you, we we're playing out spells basically every turn of the game. We're, we're kind of like naturally just ramping our way to uh, to our three and four drops. Yeah, I like this Esper mid-range a lot more than the Esper flash, just because it feels a lot more synergistic on its plan, right? The other just seems like Esper good cards and a Deathless Knight. <laughs> This actually seems like so much more like a package, you know? Like, I remember the first time, I, when we were doing together the the release, you were talking about how exactly what you wanted to do was Obscure Interceptor, this kind of Silver Smooth Goal, block, get it back. This might be the only deck that can accomplish that with some consistency with its plan. Yeah. At least we have seen so far. All right, so let's abandon any Silver Smoke Ghouls. Let's abandon the Obscura Interceptor. Okay. This is a list... I've actually played two leagues with this already, but uh, this is a white-black list that's a tokens list. And so when I played a white-black tokens list, I tried a bunch of different shells. I'd added red to play a little shell on the Scalds. I'd I'd added just played white-black. I tried the new uh, white-black Planeswalker that doubles tokens. I'd done a bunch of different stuff. Kaya? Yeah. Kaya's terrible. Don't ever play Kaya. Oh, I know. The only good Kaya deck I ever saw was a Kaya combo deck that... Try to minus two and go off with treasure makers like windfall. Yeah, there you go. That that's what the kind of thing you need to be doing. But exactly. still, your man is kind of terrible. No, okay. So the, the one thing we found though was like a flip legions landing was actually pretty good with wedding announcement because you're chucking out two two lifelink creatures and that actually is pretty good just to, uh, to have on a land in terms of like being able to grind. So I was trying to find ways to maximize flipping legions landing early. So we're playing four Legions Landing. We're playing all eight of the, the white make two token spells. So four Raise the Alarm, four Servo Exhibition to try to turn Wedding Announcement into basically like a Phyrexian Arena effect that eventually becomes a Crusade effect. Yeah. Because I think making one ones is just really weak. That's the weaker part of it. The drawing a card is, is okay. Yeah, the one ones is a fail safe. Just so that it's not outright yeah. terrible. Yeah. The other end is what you're looking for. So, and then I was thinking like, all right, what's a, what's another card we can play on three that kind of pays us off for having like two or three tokens in play? And so I, I added Rafine to this list and it's the only blue card. And it's like the classic, like, why are we adding blue? The the question you guys asked me. And It's not a classic. It's a David classic. Yeah. Like this doesn't happen to everybody else. You don't know if you, you don't know if you're going to go over the line until you go all the way up to the line, though, is the important uh, lesson. <laughs> So I, I added three Ravine to the list just because I wanted to see how good it was. And the first time I cast it, I sent you guys a screenshot. I was like, oh my God, this card is insane. It's just like they had to, it was turn five. They had to chump block with their niv to not die uh, because I had like an 8-8 token. And of course, it just drew me into the perfect card. So I, play, I played two leagues. Uh, I went 2-3 and 4-1. So it's it's an okay list. I don't I don't think this list is broken or anything. Um, Wedding Announcement just isn't a Pioneer Powerful card. Just don't play this card. I know like some people have started to play it in like uh, Transmogrify type of shells. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's no reason to do that. Yeah. So I, I like parts of this list. I love the leaving up two mana on turn two, raise the alarm end of turn and getting some value out of it. So like it was really hard for like blue red list to decide what to do. Like, do I really want to like target a raise the alarm token? <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good use of my shock. Graveyard Trespasser, Rafine, Wandering Emperor, these cards all felt really powerful. Obviously, the Fatal Push Thoughtseize part of it were powerful. So again, we're still exploring like similar space to sort of like that Orza mid-range list that people have been 5 0 with. But I think splashing for Rafine is very relevant and finding ways to make creatures on curve for Rafine. I don't know if it's, you know, like Hate Bears. You know, we talked about last Friday Containment Priest uh, as like a possible main deck card. Again, anything on two is, is going to be just more valuable than you'd think. Uh, with a Rafine, you could play um, Knight of the White Orchid. You could play Thraben Inspector. You could play Thalia and not play very many spells yourself. Thalia into Rafine, like what Thraben Thalia into Rafine is a pretty amazing curve, right? You are attacking for five on turn two if you discard spells while having a Thalia and a taxing effect in Rafine on board. This is completely unrelated, but the tax bear commander of choice has become Rafine for a reason. Interesting. And here it might actually... I haven't seen any sort of taxes aggressive below with Rafine. 
but maybe that's the way, right? Like, I don't know, Thraven Inspector, stuff like Thraven Inspector, Talia's Containment Priest, just attacking the meta. Archon of Emeria plus Rafine seems like, stupidly annoying for your opponent to deal with. Yeah, exactly. So I- I'm not sure what the exact recipe is, but I think if your three drops are a Graveyard Trespasser and Rafine, your two drops are either some kind of Hate Bear. Raise the Alarm is, is actually playable. I don't think Servo Exhibition is. And then if you want to play Fatal Push Thoughtseize, or if you want to play like White One Drops or... The other thing I was thinking about is there's that blue merfolk that um, it has an ability like one in a blue. I forget what it's called, but you put a plus one plus one counter on it. Whenever a plus one plus one counter is put on it, you get to loot. You know what? It's like in the tip of your tongue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it has a tap. I, I can't remember what the I can't remember what that mechanic is either. Benthic Biomancer. Yeah. One mana, one one for two mana. It adapts. It gets a plus one plus one counter. If it doesn't have a plus one plus one counter, and whenever you place a one one counter on it, it this it loots. Yeah. So what if you made a deck that was mostly blue black, maybe just splashing the white? So you still got to keep your fatal push thoughtsies, but you had like benthic biomancer into two drop into rafine, where benthic biomancer is getting the counters, and now you're getting some kind of like crazy selection through your deck, right? Every Loot could possibly put another plus one plus one counter on it. Every plus one plus one counter leads it to loot again. That's a loot three. So that curve allows you to loot three times because connive works at the same time, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so connive is only once, right? You don't connive yep, two yep. times one. So with the benthic, if you go like turn one benthic biomancer, turn two any two drop, if you turn three rafine, you're going to look at three cards, at this card three and have a three three. Or at whatever, whatever, if it is card lands. But then every plus one plus one counter on it, you get to loot again. So I don't know if there's something you can do where you like get all kinds of value out of your graveyard. Because you could go Benthic Biomancer into Raise the Alarm into Rafine, for instance. Okay. Attack with three. You could put up to three plus one plus one counters on it. Each of those plus one plus one counters will cause you to loot again. No, no, that's the thing. If you put the three with Rafine, it's only one loot. Oh, I see what you're saying. Benthic Biomancer is one or more, not for each one. Mm, okay. So maybe that's not as sweet. Yeah, that was my problem. That's why I said three loots. If it was like something like six loots, eh? yeah. But yeah, anyway, the 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 main point I'm trying to make is that Rafine itself is super powerful, and if you're playing it on curve, the question is, what do you do to try to take advantage of the graveyard? Because if you don't draw Rafine, the rest of your deck probably doesn't lend itself to doing that much with your graveyard. Do you just want to have a few spells with flashback on them? Like you could, for instance, play the the white black. I think it's two mana. Or it flashes back for one, a black and a white to put a creature of casting cost three or less into play. So you kind of, if you have Rafine, you just loot all that into your graveyard. And then if they kill Rafine, you just bring it back. Rafine actually lines up really well against all the red removal right now. Because that ward one is a big hassle for Phoenix players to try to get through. Yeah. I, I keep being shocked. Since the day you said Graveyard Transpasser was going to be amazing, I didn't believe it. And I'm still shocked it's amazing. <laughs> and that you still played in every single black deck list, and it's not a mistake. No, that's all. I mean, it's like fifteen dollars on uh, on MTGO now. It's like it took every it took the whole world a long time to listen, but now they're they're forced to hear me rattle on about it all the time. Like when you said it, I was like, the only reason I'm not saying he's insane is because I know he knows a lot more than me, in Pioneer. But I was surprised that day, and I'm surprised now that every single black list you have shown me for the past two months. Has between three or four great trespassers. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great against Phoenix. It's great against all aggro lists, and it's reasonable against control. It's just it's not weak against anything. And again, the fact that it's black is really relevant because all cyborg cards in Pioneer are either like graveyard hate, specifically anti control cards like Dovin's Veto or Mystic Dispute, or they're very specific color hosers. And because no good color hoser has been printed for black, it's just it's not a card that can easily be tre- uh, handled for one one mana. So those are all ideas that I had. I mean, I, I think there's something here. Uh, Rafine, I think, after playing with it, is is actually the most powerful of these cards. I, I think Obscura Interceptor is unfortunately a little too clunky. I think it, it, it it's probably playable. But yeah, I think the list I'm most excited about is the Esper Midrange. Uh, having played the tokens list, it's fine. I feel like there's improvements that I can make. There's a lot of cards that can be, you know... I mean, I think the biggest problem with this tech list is that we're focusing on wedding announcement instead of Rafine. Well, that's what I'm saying is we cut the wedding announcement, we cut the servo exhibition, we cut the legions landing, and then we can decide what we want to put in those slots. No, no, no. I, I was agreeing with you. Like, yeah, so we want an expert token stick. We're just focusing on the wrong part. Let's see how we can focus on the correct. We want, an, I don't know if expert tokens, we want expert taxes. Let's make expert taxes great again. Yeah, exactly. 
So yeah, I mean, I, I think building this around Thalia seems very reasonable to me, and we can cut most of these spells, just play a bunch of creatures. You know what? I, I think you might make me play my first League of Pioneer in weeks, if we can get together <laughs> something with that can go through one Thraven Inspector, turn two Thalia, turn three Rafin, and be a decent deck. If we can accomplish that, you're getting me into Pioneer. All right, here we go. For anyone that doesn't know, my first deck ever was Taxes, and I'm enamored by that strategy. My only problem is it's unplayable. <laughs> so it's a mixture of I like winning and I like playing and I, I love playing Mopey 1-1s one or 2-1s that's why I love Eternal Witness that's why I love Wandering Mind I love Quaddle I love small creatures that do cool stuff in modern you have to play better creatures than white ones yeah. but in Pioneer maybe you still can yeah so I will say like the, the tokens lists I have right now I absolutely smoked uh, multiple blue red lists across two leagues and uh, red black lists I really struggled against other creature lists, so Mono Green, Winota. The one card I want to highlight is my sideboard tech, Fiend Slayer Paladin. This is a card that people are going to start playing a ton of. This card is awesome. This is one white white for a 2-2 lifelink, and it cannot be targeted by your opponent's red or black spells. So against red black, they have literally no way to target it. And again, this is a card that is a great body to absorb tokens. If you want to play with Scalds, you should put Fiend Slayer Paladin in your sideboard. If you want to play with Rafine or Wandering Emperor that are going to also pump up your pa- your Paladin, you should play Fiend Slayer Paladin in your sideboard. You can just race. Just let. You don't even have to interact. You don't have to have Graveyard Trespasser. You don't have to have Hearse. They can Treasure Cruise all they want. If they can't kill the, the Fiend Slayer Paladin and Rafine gives it a couple plus one plus one counters, they literally cannot race this card uh, and you'll just kill them. Also, I'm going to add every single deck list I have seen. Like, not only yours... In the past two weeks, has exactly two unlicensed cards in the sideboard. Yeah, this card is sick. I, I literally could not lose to blue red. It, it, it is a buy. If if you, all you want to do is beat blue red, even with all the terrible cards in this list, it just wasn't even close. I mean, if you go like the curve, like it doesn't play that much spot removal to deal with stuff like turn malicious landing, turn two tokens, turn three Rafine. Killing the one for is hard by itself, especially with the ward, and the tokens are gonna get one by one bigger than what they can consistently kill. So besides TT, you should be fine. Yep. And no one's playing TITI anymore because they yeah. want to play. They want to play freaking the, the, the bird. Yeah, exactly. And that, like that thing just got smoked. Like I hearsed away. I attacked it with a zillion, zillion hearse. <laughs> I just come on. No, no, that, that's exactly what I mean. Like this deck. And if you go like into a more taxi build, like just go into one thrower into Talia, turn three Rafine. Imagine that the moment Talia becomes a five four or a four three. Yeah. The other thing is Rafine itself is an awesome body to hold the counters. So like, okay, they they stop your ground or whatever. Like I would just attack with Rafine, uh, flash in um, Wandering Emperor, like give it a plus one, plus one counter. It loots like twice, you know, just throw throw one ones away just to put a bunch of counters on it. And it's like, all right, now you have to race this thing. That's just, you know, attacking for like six or seven in the air and like letting me, you know, tutor for whatever I need, removal spell or whatever. Another important part about when you are conniving once you discard, the counters get placed automatically. So if you want to make your creature... Like, let's say if you're playing around a, a, a shock and you have, like, a Talia attacking. You don't have to discard two, maybe, two non-lands and then they get to bolt it before... to shock it before they get the counters. They have to shock it prematurely or... Uh, or and if they shock it, you get to discard your lands. And if they don't shock it, you get to make it bigger. They don't get to decide after seeing what you discard. Yeah, that's a great point. The other one little like mini piece of tech I want to highlight is you should be playing like a one of Secure the Waste on all these lists and two high of the Eye Tyrants. It just gives you a way to just steal games out of nowhere. Is like you just, if you have a Rafine in play and you're just staring at each other, you just secure the waste for like six one ones. And then all of a sudden your Rafine just gets to attack for like 10 or whatever. And same if you have Hive of the Eye Tyrant. All of a sudden it's like they've got, they build up their board mono green and you just like attack with Hive and do eight. And the next turn you're threatening to do like 13 or something because it's unblock, it's functionally unblockable or they have to throw away like multiple creatures each yeah. time. So, so those are all just like small synergies. It doesn't seem like a big thing, but like just in playing normal magic without having to play any bad cards, if you'll cut the wedding announcements, etc., you all of a sudden have this like faux combo, like it's not a combo kill, but it's like all of a sudden your opponent has to have a very specific set of cards or they, they, they lose that turn. Okay. Yeah. Rafin seems like. Something I really underestimated at first, not realizing how powerful Conhive could become. 
I over I underestimated it as well. Like I was literally like, oh, I'm just a classic. I'm going to show screenshots. These guys are going to like tease me for having one blue card in the list. And then it's like every time I've been played, like this card is like legitimately insane. It would just like loot four, add three power to the play. They're like chumping with their Niv Mizzet. It's like all right, this this is what I need to be doing. I think there's a huge difference in between having a Rafin as your almost top end in your aggressive deck over having Nico Aris as a 3-drop in your 4-drop and 5-drop when you're trying double of color peep. I think... <laughs> I don't think I think a third color is wrong. I think sometimes the reason is wrong. Yeah, well, you won't get an argument from me. I, I, I was lost in the sauce. <laughs> and in this one, I'm actually quite happy with it. Like, I think Rafin works amazingly well for these sort of white base aggro decks. Yeah, and so yeah, I, I think there's a bunch of space to explore. Exactly like you say, I think we can make a taxes list. I think we can we can find ways to like maximize Rafine. The only thing that holds Rafine back is its casting cost. If this was like a white, white, blue, or black, black, blue card, this would literally j- legitimately be one of the best three drops in the entire format, I believe. The fact that you have to play all three colors is 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 a real cost. Yeah, forcing it into Esper is a lot more annoying. Yeah, and Esper's only fast land is the white-black land, so you're really encouraged oh. for blue to be your splash color. You made me realize one of the things I heard about, but you, you got to remind me of one of the things I heard about. Give me eight, give me the fast lands. I'm not asking yeah, for... Yeah, we, we, we have to have the fast lands. It's unacceptable. It's Yeah, it's sort of embarrassing by this point. The f- only few colors getting fast lands is really annoying. Esper gets so punished by having one instead of two play sets. I mean, okay, yeah. All right, so those are my ideas. We do have a cool list here from Camberleaf, who is a very active member of the Faithless Brewing Discord. And they've proposed a list that is really taking advantage of Cunning Nightbonder. So they, they took what we learned from last week and without knowing it pushed us into the Obscura week. <laughs> yeah, so Cunning Nightbonder is two blue-black hybrid mana. So blue-black, blue-black. Two-two flash. Spells with flash... Uh, cost one colorless less to cast and can't be countered. So to take advantage of the Cunning Nightbonder effect, they're playing four Wandering Emperor. So that's the nut curve as far as I can tell is EOT on their second turn, you know, whatever, you push their first card, you Cunning Nightbonder on two, you untap, you play Wandering Emperor either, you know, if they if they can attack or if you want to do it proactively. That's just awesome. You've you've played your Planeswalker way ahead of time. You even have a body to absorb the counter, right, if if, uh, Wandering Emperor exiles it. The other Flash cards are where it gets a little dicey. So they're playing four Omen of the Sea. Uh, We typically don't see that in non-Uriah lists, but with uh, Cunning Nightbonder, it's a little more attractive. Four Brazen Borrower and four Spell Queller, along with two Archangel Avacyn. And there's a final four drop? I think it's just... Yeah, it's Settle the Wreckage. Just Settle, okay. Yeah, so Settle is an instant, not but not a card with Flash. So Cutting Knight Bonder, they, they've built in a bunch of cool synergies here. Uh, there's a few cards I'd quibble with, but I like the idea specifically of Knight Bonder into Wandering Emperor. That is something, you know, I can get down with that. Yeah, I'm not a fan of stuff. Maybe like Kaido is the one that rings a bell. That seems strange. I don't like Kaido, I don't like Brazen Borrower, uh, and I don't really like Spell Queller. And I think maybe that it sh- they should play more two mana counter spells, because then you kind of put the like counter spell Cunning Night Bonder, like. You know what card would be amazing here? Graveyard Trespasser? <laughs> no, besides Graveyard Trespasser, you know it. Obscura Interceptor? Yeah, I, I, I think that is the, the card we should be looking at. <laughs> at least it's a one of our two of, maybe like even better than Avacyn. Just allow you to have more cards that really are great with the curve turn two night ponder into turn like just amazing cards with the curve turn two night ponder into turn three of square interceptor or wandering emperor. It's devastating. Yeah. Also, your mana requirements are really tough, right? Like Cunning Night Bonder has blue black hybrid mana, so that technically could be either. But you want it to be blue blue because you have Brazen Borrower, so you need to cast Brazen Borrower to take advantage of the cost reduction and to get your two for one there. You need to play one colorless blue blue blue. But then you also, the the nut draw involves Wandering Emperor on white-white, and uh, Avacyn has white two white pips as well. Yeah, it's exactly as you said. If you got the race and borrower, it all becomes so much easier. Especially because fundamentally, I think decks with Wandering Emperor are not that aggressive, right? Wandering Emperor is an awesome defensive card. You want to be able to put it in on, in response to them casting a spell or attacking, exile a creature. You've got the body in play already with Cunning Nightbonder or Obscure Interceptor. I like the idea of you flash in Night Bonder and then you pass with three mana up. If they cast a creature into it, you can choose to intercept her. If they attack, you can Wandering Emperor because Wandering Emperor is awesome. You can even wait all the way into your end step. Um, 
So yeah, I, I love I love that idea. Uh, and, and you're not really like curving into Brazen Borrower because you know you you, you can cast it on three anyway. So and to cast like double spell on turn three, you're doing something like Omen of the Seas plus Brazen Borrower, and not you're not gonna have triple blue because you are not. At least in most games, it's gonna be pretty tough. Like you have the four concealed courtyard and the planes that dot them for blue. I think also. Maybe one black omen is not insane if you add like star- cards like Obscure Interceptor and you have more creatures. Or maybe just go up to 80 cards, play Orion. If you're going to play Omen of the Sea, then I I, I can't recommend playing Orion because I want to be the change I want to see in the world. But <laughs> Omen of the Sea with your Orion, right, is, is when Omen of the Sea is at its best. It's just giving you so much selection, so much card draw. Uh, you just won't see your like Cunning Night Bonder, you know, your nut draw openings will just be, you know that less frequent. If I'm not mistaken, the Asorius controlling Pioneer is a lot of times running Yorion and the only cards they link are Narset, Omen of the Seas, and Wandering Emperor, right? Yeah, basically. Wandering Emperor Blinked is so sweet, by the it's way. So like getting it end of turn and you get to amazing. make another two two is just so crazy. It's ridiculous. Every time you do it, I'm just like, what the hell? <laughs> I, I had that happen the other day. I was like, I had like the dream scenario. I was playing the a lot. Uh, it was a few weeks ago when I was playing the um, Asorius Blink in Modern, and I went in my turn three flicker. We found something. Turn four, my opponent says the Wandering Emperor, or maybe it was like a, a few turns later. And then I play a Yorion, bounce the flicker at the one Emperor, Emperor comes back, make a choo choo, flicker with Exile's Emperor again, comes back at my opponent's end step, exile something, on my turn, exile something. It was just like so much value. Emperor Ward, Emperor being warded like that is so much fun. So yeah, super cool list from Camberleaf. Uh, obviously, you know, we don't 100% agree with all the lists, but I love the Cunning Knight Bonder into Wandering Emperor. That is powerful enough as a shell, I think, that it's worth exploring. Yeah. Uh, what you do with the rest of the cards is is kind of up to you. Just that you're on an Arafin, because yeah, why there not? You go. <laughs> That's what we learned today. Yeah. Can't, it can't be that wrong, I will say. <laughs> Rafin can never be completely wrong. It could be better, but never wrong. Right. All right, so we are going to leave the world of Pioneer. We are going to enter the world of Modern. So, into the world of Modern, I'm going to be completely frank. For the past year... Uh, approximately since Modern Horizons 2 has been released, there has only been one Esper deck that has held the spotlight of existing since black became the worst color in Modern. Black used to be the color you went for when you needed the best removal, and that's not true anymore, which means the only reason to be on black is if you want discard spells. And if you want discard spells, it's extremely weird you will want counter spells, at least the common ones. So why are you playing blue, except if you're playing, I don't know, stuff like Rixie's Shadow? Rixie's Shadow tends to be the only exception of running um, black and blue nowadays in modern, because they're playing really efficient spells all the time. So that means that Esper Control died when, instead of playing Fatal Push, you could play Solitude and, Mar- and Prismatic Ending and eventually March. So they just kicked it out. However, there's one card that kept people in playing Esper, which is Persist. So we have the Esper Animator decklist featuring... Solitude, Grief, Archon of M, of course it's featuring the Archon of Cruelty alongside Faithful Mending, Persist, and the brand new card, which has been amazing every single time I have seen it in multiple decks, Tainted Indulgence. Yeah, and Tainted Indulgence, I think, is very uniquely good in Reanimator in a way it isn't good in other lists because you have the Archon of Cruelty. You're very likely to have a casting cost of five. After you have their first Archon of Cruelty in the graveyard, you don't need to loot anymore, right? Just drawing two is better. So this list, because Solitude and Grief are, yes, technically, when you look it up at the right corner of those cards, four and five mana spells, they don't cost any mana. You have, you know, your two drops, your your Faithful Mendings, other Tainted Indulgence, Persist. You have three drops, uh, Teferi, and uh, some interesting other cards here. We have one drops. So it's very easy to turn Tainted Indulgence in the mid to late game into just two mana instant draw to, which is an insane card. Exactly. And the fact, as you said, the most important part is, after you have one Archon, do you really need to keep discarding stuff in Modern? However, this list, the Ruffin Tower, as we have seen with the Band Triumph, has been amazing in helping you play three color mana bases. I think you saw the difference when you were playing the other day, and I have seen it as well. Just having access to in modern one or two Triumphs and in Pioneer the full playset really makes a difference. Absolutely. And it also has some beautiful spice. Now that it has eight discard outlets, when it only used to have the four Faithful Mending and, f- and the full playset of Unmarked Grave, now that they play from zero to two graves and the full playset of Tainted Indulgence, they are playing. A Master of Death. 
Master of Death, as I describe it pretty efficiently today, it's Squee. Yeah, t- tell us about Master of Death. This is a card I literally did not know what it was. I'd never seen it before. <laughs> so it's a 3 mana 3-1 three that surveils two on ETV. A blue, a black, and, a co- and a, any color. So why would you play this in modern? Well, it has the Squee text, almost Squee text, that at the beginning of your upkeep, you may pay one life and put it into your hand from your graveyard. That means if you have a lot of discard effects or looting effects, this is free card advantage, right? Because if I discard this with a turn 2 Faithful Mending and then I return it, if I discard it again in my next Faithful Mending, they have become actual card advantage. Because I discarded nothing. I just kept getting back a master that kept going into my graveyard. Not only that, sometimes you're gonna discard it, get it back, and excite it to a grief. And then your grief was free. Or your Faithful Mending, either your grief was a one for one, or your faithful mending was card advantage. You can see it in any way, and you're gonna amount to the same reasoning. You didn't lose cards in the process of playing a free pitch spell or a loot spell. Yeah, and this deck really leans into it by playing Collective Brutality, which is another way to turn a piece of cardboard in your hand into something, right? Either two life from your opponent, or, a, you know, a dress effect, or, you know, killing their Eidolon of whatever. Uh, and then, yeah, you just pay the life on the next turn and get the uh, Master back. And because you're playing four Faithful Mendings, plus the flashback there, the, the life loss should not matter as much. Uh, you know, you're, you're turning your hand, you're, you're going down cards, but you're gaining life with Faithful Mending. Master Death is giving you that card back and only taking some of the life back. Exactly. And Priest of Felright is another pretty good thing to discard as it becomes a 5-mana uncontrollable reanimate. So it's not something bad to have in your graveyard as you're going down the game. Yeah, I love the look of this list. Uh, I didn't think I'd like these as much because I thought Unmarked Grave was really important in terms of the nut draw with Reanimator, but this list just has the ability to grind so well with uh, that Master of Death package. I think the Master of Death is a senior acquisition, and I want to play this list just because I want to play Master of Death. I have wanted to play it since I have seen it spoil in Modern Horizons 2, and I never found a deck list that convinced me because there are not many looting effects playable in Modern. Like, these decks only used to play Faithful Mending, and now Tainted Indulgence, I think it's what just picks, gives you the bow, the bow on the package, the, just makes it all clean and effective. Yeah, it's even a, a pseudo-unique uh, three-drop, right? So it and Teferi are your only three, so it also even contributes to Tainted Indulgence just getting turned into a, a you know, you cast, fa- maybe you can even cast, if it's your only three, you can cast Tainted Indulgence in your upkeep, and then still get it back. <laughs> for the ultimate card advantage. <laughs> for the ultimate card advantage spell. So yeah, I'm quite intrigued. I love Tainted Indulgence. I love that Transful Mending also has flashbacks, so this deck gains a lot of card advantage from discarding stuff. And I think its fair plan becomes a lot better post-cyborg when you just add prismatic endings, Turax, and as every cyborg decklist I have seen in the past month, two unlicensed cards in the sideboard. Gotta have two. No one plays three, no one plays one, everyone plays exactly two. Yeah, they've run the numbers and uh, I'm in no position to disagree with them. They were right. So, and finally for modern, we have what a lot of people used to love playing back in the day, an Esper Control build, or better known as Esper Draw Go. The only sorcery spell card in this deck is Prismatic Ending and the Teferis. Uh, there's a Jace. There's a Jace. Okay, sorry. So six place walkers as your wing cons and your endings. And if you say Shark Typhoon is played at sorcery speed, <laughs> I saw you looking at the Typhoon. No the one cast the Typhoon. I was looking at it. I was like, oh, I can you. Yeah. No, no one. If casting the Typhoon is a mistake. Say that yellow hat. <laughs> if Nassif said casting it is a mistake, full stop. No arguing. And any data on your opponent's sense step is worth more than possibly multiple four fours alongside a game along a game. Alright, well I'm in no position to argue with the yellow hat. So it's interesting. This list, you know, is playing a lot of the cards we've come to expect. Solitude, Wandering Emperor, three Snapcaster Mage. We've got the full boat of uh, Archmage's Charm. Uh, like you said, the Planeswalkers, uh, a couple of verdicts. The only reason they're splashing black is for some sideboard cards and four main deck Tainted Indulgence. So what is your thought on this? So we've got one drops in Prismatic Ending. We've got a bunch of two drops with Snapcaster Mage and Counterspell. Uh, we have some threes, we've got four, we've got five, we've got six. So, I mean, do you think they're... I think you're forgetting... This is, I think, David, Love for Pioneer. We have Fetchlands that are zero. Sure, in, sure. In, in all, and that makes it so five becomes... So, like, a, a normal curve of Fetchland into Counterspell, maybe an ending, already puts you at three. So, practically anything that goes into a graveyard after that, maybe you pitch a Solitude, maybe you shackle a Typhoon. I think in Modern it's pretty easy to turn on Tainted Indulgence. So I'm just saying, like, 
In your mind, is is the fail case for tainted indulgence in a fair deck like even close to playable? Like, how much of a punishment is it? Like, it's okay, it's turn two. Your opponent doesn't play in a counter spell for whatever reason, or they don't play a two drop you deign worthy of countering. You just cast tainted indulgence, and you draw two, discard one. That's not like horrific, but is that is that like a card that you think is like reasonably playable? Because you're also going to attack your own graveyard, right? Snapcaster Mage is going to be exiling Archmage's Charm some some percentage of the time. I don't love the Snapcaster Mages, and I agree on you with that. I think Snapcaster shouldn't be here alongside it. I think you should just be playing more cards like Wandering Emperor and the full playset of Solitude because it's heresy. Oh, to not play four. There aren't that many white cards left in this deck because we're playing four tainted indulgences. I mean, just play more Wandering Emperor than play two. Like, right, Snapcaster Mage is a four mana play. At least make it so I have a better four mana play. Okay. I think they didn't dull in has So, in modern the problem you have in Pioneer a lot of the time where either Fatal Push or Thought CC Spar is a lot more common. It's pretty uncommon for both Contra Spell and Supreme Verdict to be good. Right. It's, okay. I don't think I have ever seen, like, it's a really weird scenario. So it's really common where you just want to discard one of those cards, and I don't think that's insane. In modern card, quality is going to be better than quantity a lot of the time, because you can get back card advantage so easily. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't think that's that much of a problem. I think yours, what you gain for black is access to Leyland of the Void uh, alongside Kaya's Guile in the sideboard. I think I would play Kaya's Guile main deck as well. Yeah, and then there's also a Void Rend, right? That's just the classic eraser. I mean, it's it's yeah okay against a bunch of decks. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who would you say kills Titan. Why would you? I mean, so many cards kill Titan. Why would you bring in Void Rend? I think it's a card you play in the main deck as a catch it all. Like, why play a catch it all in your sideboard, right? No, I I totally agree with you. I'm more just joking. I, I hate those kinds of cards in the sideboard. It's like, oh, I can play Vindicate. It kills anything. It's like you want you want to think about what actual deck you want this card for, like. I totally agree with you, especially if you're going to play three Snapcaster Mages. Void Rend is the kind of card that pays you off for having Snapcaster Mages because it lets you do that thing. <laughs> exactly, twice. it's an effect that you get to you get two uses out of. I think Void Rend is a sort of card you play in your main deck when you're like, okay, so I would like to have an answer to if my opponent is playing Enchantress, I would like to have an answer, and if my opponent is playing any midrange deck, it's decent top deck, and if not, I can just cut it post cyborg. Like, who am I cyborging Void Rend against? Yeah, I, I don't like that part of it. The the ley lines are interesting. So you're playing white, you can just play Rest in Peace. But because they're playing Snapcaster Mage and Memory Deluge, they want access to their graveyard. And I and I guess Tainted Indulgence. So I like the Tainted Indulgence as a package. It encourages you to splash black. If you're going to splash black, then you can play really the best graveyard hate that you can even hard cast. It's not impossible for this deck to get to four mana and just cast uh, a ley yeah. line on turn four. But yeah, I like this deck list. I, however, think that if I'm playing Esper, I'm taking a real advantage of playing Black and playing a deck, a deck, a deck list like the one upstairs. With the with Persist as the card you think is the, maybe the best Black card in the format. If not, I or if not, I'm going full meme. I'm playing a control deck with 80 cards and I'm playing Accumulated Knowledge and four mending for the Indulgence. <laughs> okay. So we just go full on black. We just go full on. We play four frantic inventory, full four dangerous, four mending, and hope for the best. I like it. So we don't see a lot of full on Esper cards. You know, we don't expect any of those except for maybe a, a one of Void Rend here or there to make it. But Tainted Indulgence is really a new tool to either play fair or not fair uh, because it can be, it does something very unique uh, that no other card in modern can do. Exactly. And that's what we are playing this card for. But yeah, that's exactly what we were saying at the beginning. In Pioneer, you're seeing a bit more of the real Esper card swing effect. In Modern, it's Tainted Indulgence plus Friends. Right. <laughs> and I think that's the last we have of our beautiful Esper decks for now. So we can go say hi to an old friend of ours that you were laughing about a few good 20 minutes ago. Yeah, so our card from last week was Ledger Shredder. So just a quick reminder, Ledger Shredder, one in a blue for a 1-3 flying bird advisor. And whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, Ledger Shredder connives. And conniving is drawing a card, then discarding a card. If you discard a non-land card, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. So this is a card that uh, Dan was very correct to highlight. We're seeing it in a bunch of different shells. But the concern I had as far as a brewer was that 
this card really lends itself to like two specific kinds of shells. One, decks that really want to fill up the graveyard to cast delve spells. And uh, two, a reanimator shells. And specifically, the best reanimator shell in all of Pioneer is Grease Fang. The actual reanimation spells are, you know, five mana. So it's hard to cheat on stuff. Grease Fang basically cheats on an eight drop by putting a three drop into play first. So I don't think there's a lot of space left to explore in the like blue red, you know, Xerox space. I mean, you're going to play your eight cantrips. You're going to play, you know, some number of your, your shock variants. You're going to play treasure cruise. You're going to play expressive iteration. When is ledger shredder good? When is it not good? Right. It's, it's a little different than thing in the ice at the matchup profile. It's good against, it's very good in the mirror because your opponent's also going to cast two spells. Right. But it's much worse against decks like Winota. It does not sweep the board. So, you know, it's it's all about, you know, in those shells, really what you think you're going to face and uh, and how you want to combat them. I was interested in trying it out uh, in a deck that was somewhat a uh, Xerox list, but of course I had to go into my uh, Grixis medium bag. Um, I was interested in trying out like a Maestro's Ascendancy and Probable Alliance type of shell where we are getting paid off for drawing our second card all the time and then using a bunch of our tokens to trigger Maestro's Ascendancy or to be food for uh, village rights. Dan did not realize Maestro's Ascendancy required you to sacrifice a creature and he thought the card was amazing. (laughs) I will say every time I drew Maestro's Ascendancy, it was awesome. Uh, with Young Pyromancer in play, or any of the other token makers, if you want to play the um, Sedgemore Witch, or the oh. Poppet Mender, or whatever the heck it's called. I think Sedgemore Witch is the best of the two of them. I think Young Pyromancer is the best of the three, just due to being a two drop. Yeah, no, I agree. The The one thing that I will commend the Poppet Stitcher on is it has three toughness. Okay. Unless you're very aggressive, the Witch is just going to die to a one-mana spell or the front half of Bone Crusher. And so you really won't be able to play her till turn four. You can play Poppet Stitcher on three. It's it's going to survive most of the spells, but you know now we're starting to see more strangle, specifically because of Ledger Shredder. Um, <laughs> so people are, are actually ready for three toughness as well. So maybe neither of those is a great option. But if you really want to get deep into Maestro's Ascendancy, you can even play Improbable Alliance. That card was actually okay. Was it okay? That was so. When, I, when we were discussing this specific deck list with Dan, we saw a few things that intrigued me. I think it was Seagate Stormcaller, Improbable Alliance, and I think that, what if you just go full on token making and like three Maestro's Ascendancy and four Sets for Witch for Young Pyromancer? Yeah, I, I think if I would try this list again, that's what I would do. I would go all in on the token making. I don't know that I would play Ledger Shredder, actually. I think Ledger Shredder, in general, the looting just isn't worth... The, the payment. Yeah, it's not worth a card unless you're actually getting something out of it. So either you're looting, you know, your your giant uh, vehicle in the graveyard, or you're you're fundamentally reducing one of your five uh, delve spells. Right, it's, you're functionally like generating a mana, almost like a uh, that three three dwarf that like makes a mana every time you cast a spell. Right, like makes Bitchy. a red and doesn't. Loot. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, if it's doing that kind of thing. The other thing is, this deck is playing 23 lands, so a lot of the blue red lists are only playing like 18 or 19 lands, so they're often making their Shredder really big. Well, we don't want to discard our spells. We want to trigger Young Pyromancer. Um, and so I, I showed you some of these screenshots where I made a zillion tokens and my Ledger Shredder, which had been played since turn two, was like three power. So we're, we're just not getting paid off enough for it. So I think Ledger Shredder is an awesome card. I think it's a powerful card, but I think it basically, it's found its two homes in Pioneer and it's very good in them. And I think it's very matchup dependent on if, and if you want to play them or not. This shell was not a great home for it. I, because Ledger Shredder didn't, add very much power it was really hard for me to get a clock on so i was way ahead against red white heroic uh, i was way ahead against jeskai transmogrify and um you couldn't close the game yeah i just couldn't close the game they were at like three or four and i just couldn't kill them or they were at eight and i had pyromancer with six tokens they had two blockers and like i threw you know everything at them and then they you know whatever red white heroic just got in and just did a zillion damage to me with <laughs> they did bonus heroic stuff yeah. So yeah, I started out the league 0202 and felt terrible. And then luckily I got to play against Grease Fang, which is, you know, a terrible deck. And their Shredder was garbage. Uh, and it triggered my Shredder and I, you know, found my hate pieces. And then I beat Winota and we both had a bunch of mediocre draws. And I just got destroyed by Red Black midrange. But yeah, I like I like going all in on tokens and abandoning Ledger Shredder. I don't think like the, the loot ability on Shredder just... I, I can't think of any other way to use it other than the way it's being used right now. Uh, I don't think you can just like play to loot with it. And like playing it on turn two as like a removal check, 
uh, here's a spoiler alert. It's going to die. Like, everyone's just playing. They're ready for it. They're going to strangle it. They'll have cast an instant response. They'll, they're will they playing Fatal Push. They're playing um, March. They're playing P-Hole. They're playing the uh, three-mana 2-2 two, two werewolf that exiles it. I, I never got one above three power. So. I mean, if you're going to play a removal check, at least play one like Young Peter Manser. I mean, Young Peter Manser is a removal check. That's more which are removal checks that at least have better upside if they survive. And again, I think Ledger Shutter as something that helps you find your um, delve spells while fueling them, that is a payoff that I'm interested in. I, okay. I think it, it does have a home in, in Blue Red. And like I said, the matchup spread is all, the only thing that determines it there, right? Is it probably a little worse against Mono Green? It's much worse against Winota. It's probably a little better against, you know, Lotus Field. It's very, it's way better in the mirror. Yeah. We're, there's probably a ton of mirrors right now. So that's why people are playing it, right? You, It's like a prisoner's dilemma. You are losing points against Winota. You're hoping the other guy is chasing Winota out with his uh, thing in the ice, and then you get to smoke him when you play or them uh, when you play them. So you both will win more if you both chase Winota, but you're just facing each other because you just, you, didn't, you just fought <laughs> against yourself. Right, exactly. So the Winota player just cruises through both of you, and then you guys are just hoping you know, whichever one draws more treasure cruises wins. So. It's a super cool card. It's fun when you start to just like turbo through your deck. You've got like two shredders and a young pyromancer in play, and I'm just like looting away all my lands and like you know finding my treasure cruises. But it's like this list isn't great at using that. The other thing is, I think to make sure you have enough spells for shredder, you need to play a bunch of cantrips. So then you can't go into the like more controlling shell like I have here, where you're playing like four push and four thought seas and a bunch of other one man removal. So I think it causes a case ca- a cascading series of decisions that basically ends you up at the existing blue red uh, Xerox list. But yeah, it's a super cool addition. It's been fun to watch people play it in uh, Pioneer, and I'm glad it's a card that people are having a lot of success with. But I don't know that there's a lot of like space left to brew. Is kind of my sense. I think it has found its homes where its looting is efficient enough, and if it's not exactly, and if you're not looking for a body that loots, there's better things to be doing. Yeah, and the payoffs for that second draw just aren't there. Like Improbable Alliance is not a very powerful card. I thought about playing it with uh, Joel Reel uh, as well, like in an uh, Salt Eye Shell. But it's like, man, there's a lot of shocks flying around. <laughs> like, Joriel is never making a 2-2. And if, if she is, it's also going to get shocked. No, what I, what I do would love to see is what we were discussing. A Maestro's Ascendancy deck. Yeah. I think that's something we could have some fun with. Ascendancy was really good every time I cast it. So maybe, yeah, you play like three Ascendancy, four Young Pyromancer, and then a bunch of other like random stuff. Ascendancy stacks, right? You only had one. Let me let me check the exact. So I'm gonna read Master's Ascendancy for anyone that has no idea. Yeah, Grixis mana. Grixis mana, of course. Maestro's mana. Yeah, Maestro's. So Maestro's mana. You have a three man enchantment which reads: Once during each of your turns, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your graveyard by sacrificing a creature in addition to paying each other's cost. If a spell cast this way will be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. So really important. It stacks. And allows you to play on your turn and in your opponent's turn. So I think you need quite a critical mass of instant sorceries where you are able to just... Like, the goal with this and a young pyromancer is the fact you get to cast two free cards per turn, like value-wise. Like an instant and a sorcery, for example. And again, automatically turns on push on their turn, which is awesome against Winota. Like, that came up and they're okay. just like, oh, what the heck? Like, yeah, you're done, dude. Like, you, you, just, you just leave push in your graveyard. You just have to leave up a black every turn and they just never get to Winota you. But for, for in order to make it work, you need Young Pyromancer, or you need the Search for Witch. Maybe you just play 11 of the Token Makers. Just go all in on the plan of having a Token Maker as a Maestro's Ascendancy as your payoff. And then just yeah. play literally 30 instants of sorceries. The other thing you can do is you can play Kroxa and cast instants with the sack trigger on the stack. So... That, that's worth thinking about, like having all Croaks in here. Yeah. Okay, I like it. Seems like a fun idea to brew when we, if we ever get to Maestro's Week. <laughs> exactly. But with that being said, I think this is it for now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think we're going to see a ton more of Shredder because I think we're going to see a ton of the Blue Red Xerox list until, you know, Doomsday, if they decide to make a ban decision. We talk a lot about the possible configurations of the format on our Friday episode. We went through, well, we're recommending unbans, but if they do ban uh, cards, um, I, th- I think some, some card from the blue red list is likely going to be on the chopping list, if not if not more than one. Yeah, if I had to make my, my guesses, it would be 
Winota itself, either hidden strings or the field, and treasure cruise. Maybe treasure cruise and DTT. Yeah, it's just so wild. Like, you know, when you look back at modern, when they banned treasure cruise, they also banned dig through time, but nobody was playing dig through time just because treasure cruise is weirdly so much better, even though it's the common and dig through time is the rare. Now, dig through time in Pioneer has led to a bunch of other bannings, right? They, they banned uh, wilderness reclamation, that shell had both Wilderness Reclamation and the 7 mana instant take a turn that goes back into your library and the inverter. All those lists took advantage of Dig Through Time. Dig Through Time was like one of the best cards in the list. So Dig Through Time has definitely been like the culprit in a bunch of bannings, but right now it's seeing no play. It doesn't see any play in combo lists. It doesn't see play in control lists and it doesn't see play in blue red lists unless they're specifically trying to dodge Narset. Can you get a Narset in play and have it survive? Because Strangle actually does a really good job of killing Narset now. Yeah, now you have ways to actually pressure an asset that weren't here two weeks ago. So yeah, just do that. That, that, that that's what we're playing next week. Four young Pyromancer, four Sex for Witch, four Struggle, four Thoughtsis, four Fire at Bush, four Village Rides, three of Maestro's Ascendancy. Yeah, that's that that sounds sweet. You can't play Treasure Cruise because you're gonna be eating your graveyard. <laughs> you Maybe one of. One of. You play one. But yeah. With that being said, thanks so much, David. Had a lot of fun. Yeah. Great to see you, bud. And see you soon. Bye bye everybody. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, I want you to know more about our latest brews. You can support us via Patreon, which will grant you immediate access to our Discord, where you will find our faithless brewer, alongside an army of fine leg players, hoping to find their perfect brew and trying and tumbling into what seems like success. Finally, remember to tune in on Friday for our next episode alongside the Serum Visions gun, where we'll show the final details regarding Invoke Calamity. Were we able to find the perfect shell for it? You need to find out.